For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Laura Von Hagen. You can call me Laura, and I'm a naturopathic doctor here at Higher Health in Toronto. And today is our fertility masterclass. And we're going to be talking all about optimizing egg and sperm quality. This is something I'm super passionate about. And I know that a lot of you were at the fertility show, so I hope you got some helpful information there as well. So a little bit about me, just to give some background since I haven't met many of you. Um, I've always had an interest in health. I did my undergrad in kinesiology and then I actually went on to do a master's in clinical anatomy, which was very much focused in maternal and newborn care. I did part of my internship with CETA. Went on to do my four year doctor of naturopathy, so lots of school. And when I was in my internship, I was actually on the fertility focus shift, which is a highly specialized area. So from there, my interest really only grew. Um, I presented previously at conferences on PCOS and on sperm quality and looking to continue giving more lectures in this area. And I'm also working currently on my first book, which will be all about getting pregnant with PCOS which should be coming out sometime this year. So I'll certainly keep you posted on that. So here's just a little bit of humor to get us started off. Um, I always find this one really, this cartoon is one of my favorites. And I think about you know the millions of sperm in our fallopian tubes, trying to fertilize that one egg. And what you're gonna see tonight is why it's actually very difficult for this to happen um, and what we can do to help optimize that. So for today's agenda, we're going to be talking about what impacts egg and sperm quality. And we hear this a lot, but I want to get into more of the details and also discuss um, some of the key things that we can work on. So certainly as a naturopathic doctor, really, really experts in lifestyle medicine. So we will be looking at diet and lifestyle strategies. <clears throat> we're also going to look at endocrine disrupting chemicals in our environment, which are things that you may or may not be aware of. So when we talk about that kind of toxic burden, we're looking at things that we want to remove that can negatively impact our egg and sperm quality. We're gonna talk about some key supplements and I'm not gonna get into this too much because I'll be honest, it's very individualized, but I do wanna bring up some key ones that I think are important and that patients should be aware of. And then I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the role of IV therapy which is intravenous vitamin therapy and acupuncture for both male and female infertility. So what exactly impacts egg and sperm quality? So as you can see, there is a lot. So often, maybe if patients are at a fertility clinic, they hear a lot about their age. And certainly age is a very important factor. Um, probably one of the most important factors when we're looking at egg and sperm quality and egg quality does tend to decline around 35, whereas sperm quality tends to be closer to 45. But that's really only the tip of the iceberg. As you can see on my screen, there's so many other things that impact egg and sperm quality, um, and especially things that you know, we can really modify. So diet, BMI, which is our body weight, exercise, sleep, stress, um, all very, very important mood, you know, anxiety or depression, alcohol use, recreational drug use, if you have any pre-existing conditions, genetic diseases, so if you're what we call a poor methylator or you have cystic fibrosis, um, especially autoimmune diseases, things like the thyroid. And so these are all the things I'm really investigating with my patients. And so certainly your fertility clinic will be focused on, you know, your age and your AMH and your semen analysis but I'm going through all of this. And so that's why, you know, we have these 90 minute consultations with patients because there's a lot of things to go over in that initial and a lot of health history that I'm looking at. And so that's why I really like working with patients, whether they're in preconception, just starting trying to conceive or already working with a fertility clinic because there's so much that I can do as a naturopath to support them. So we're gonna go back a little bit in time you can all remember this photo probably from like grade 10 or 12 science. And this one very important piece of the cell called the mitochondria. So eggs and sperm are made up of cells and these cells contain mitochondria. And mitochondria is really the powerhouse of the cell. So it's very important for energy production. 
And it takes a lot of energy for us, for an egg to be released, for an egg to be fertilized, for that embryo to then grow and divide, the embryo to implant in the wall of the uterus, to invade the uterine wall, to continue to grow, to grow into a child. So as you can see, there's a lot of energy requirements. And when we really look at egg and sperm quality, what we're really talking about is mitochondrial activity and mitochondrial quality. So it's not necessarily about the quantity of mitochondria, but their quality. And a really good example of this was a study that looked at why embryos arrest. And so why do some embryos in IVF not go on to progress to at day five or day six? Why do they stop? And what they actually found is that poor quality embryos on day five after an egg retrieval actually had more mitochondria than high quality embryos. And what we think is that might be due to increased metabolic requirements of the embryo. So they try and create more mitochondria as a sort of compensation method. So we're not necessarily going for more mitochondria. We're looking for how can we support the health of the mitochondria and essentially put more gas in the gas tank because these embryos just run out of gas and they're not able to divide and multiply. So we got to fill up the gas tank and that's where we need to look at diet, lifestyle, and all of those important factors. I'm just going to come out here, just see if there's any questions. Nope, we are good. Um, so I'll keep going back to the presentation then. Once I move this. As I said, not great with technology, so bear with me. Um, this is just an inter interesting graph. This is from a previous lecture I gave on sperm health uh, to a group of naturopathic doctors at our annual conference. And so what we actually see is the World Health Organization sets the criteria for what we consider normal sperm. And as you can see, their kind of cutoffs have actually gone down quite significantly in the past few years. And I'm waiting to see if they come up with new 2020 or maybe like, you know, 2025 guidelines at some point. What I find super interesting is that we used to say 14% morphology was normal. And now we're okay with 4%, which is just kind of a little bit bananas to me that we're fine with only 4% of the sperm being normal to be considered a normal sample. So we're looking for the volume. So how much semen, the concentration of the sperm, the motility, like, you know, do they swim in a straight line or just swim in circles? And then the morphology, do they have one heads, two heads, no heads? Um, these are the things we want. And this is where for me, you know, I really want to look at what's optimal and not just fine when we're looking at a sperm sample. So when we look at even just concentration, the cutoff is 15, but really optimal is closer to 50 or 60 million sperm. So I'm always looking through these things with a fine tooth comb. And if I suspect any sort of sperm quality issue, then I will, you know, really request further testing. Another test that fertility clinics run, I can't run this, but something that I do refer to if I suspect a sperm quality issue is called the DNA fragmentation rate. And we know that higher fragmentation rates are linked to poor fertilization rates, poor quality embryos, and less uh, pregnancy rates and higher miscarriage rates. And so what we see too is that if you have more fragmentation, it takes longer for that embryo to turn into a blastocyst. So we're looking for that day five or six blastocyst. A day seven blastocyst tends to be poorer quality. Ideal is less than 20%, and I've certainly seen this as high as 35% in patients and broadened it down significantly into normal range with heavy supplementation and diet and lifestyle change. So it is certainly something that we can change. Why do I care about DNA fragmentation so much? Well, if we're doing IVF and we've had our egg retrieval, unfortunately, what can happen sometimes is we can have a huge loss of embryos between days three and five. And when we have that big loss of embryos, that's when we kind of look at almost like a textbook DNA fragmentation issue. So in those cases, my preference is to really advocate for getting DNA fragmentation tested prior to IVF. And if it's a concern, then we can change around um, IVF and the types of techniques and technologies that we're using. So this is a good test to be aware of and really falls under that sperm quality piece that we can modify. 
All right, let's get into the diet and lifestyle. Um, this is when I feel a little bit like Dr. Killjoy. They take all the fun out of patients' lives, but I want you to have fun. But more importantly, I want you to get pregnant. So you might not like what I always have to say, but it's because I want the best outcome for you. So first and foremost, sleep. And oh my goodness, this is a hard one for a lot of patients. So when we look at males, um, we know that, and this was in college students because they're you know, easy subjects to test, that they're sleeping less than seven hours or more than nine hours consistently that had a negative impact on sperm quality. The interesting thing though is if they switch their sleeping patterns to getting more around that eight hours on a consistent basis, their sperm quality improves. You're probably wondering, well, why more than nine hours? Isn't more sleep better? Well, we do think that perhaps if they're sleeping more than nine hours, maybe they're suffering from depression, maybe they're uh, less active. So there's these other confounding factors, but for sure, quality sleep is important. So this means putting your screens away at night, going to bed at a regular bedtime, getting up at the same time, even on weekends, not doing what this person is doing and sitting on your phone in bed where all that blue light is flooding your face and disrupting it. I cannot stress how important sleep is. For women, really interesting, we see that increased levels of melatonin, so the hormone that gets released during sleep, has been correlated with higher levels of progesterone. So we don't know causation, but we know that sleep quality tends to affect our hormones in a positive way. So especially for anyone who is trying to conceive or struggling with infertility, it can be very, very stressful. And I really try to focus on good sleep hygiene. Exercise is another one. And this is probably one of the most common questions I get, because if you go on Dr. Google, you're going to get 10 different answers. You're going to get told, do hit, don't do hit. Exercise is good. Exercise is bad. Too much exercise. Don't exercise. You need to exercise. Should I exercise is kind of what happens when patients come in my door. So yes, too much exercise is bad. And really what is too much? More than five hours of intense strenuous exercise per week. So the way I look at it is if you're out running 10K every morning for an hour, that's way too much. Or pre-COVID, when I had my patients, you know, the heavy CrossFitters, they're at the gym for an hour of intense workout every morning at 6 a.m., which is cutting into the sleep, which is, you know, crazy raising their stress hormones. That is too much exercise. I would say right now, though, with COVID, there's very few people who are getting too much exercise because there's nowhere to go. So I would actually really encourage moderate intensity exercise. What is moderate intensity? You're breaking a bit of a sweat. You know, it's hard for you to hold a conversation, but you're not totally breathless. And we want to do that on most days of the week for 30 to 45 minutes. So that could be doing a strength training video at home, a YouTube video, um, going for a run, going for a bike ride, and it's not snowy and icy, right? Getting outside and moving your body is certainly important. So I really, really try to stress the importance of exercise. And honestly, in my practice, and I've been seeing patients for over five years now, I've maybe had two or three patients where I had to tell them to cut back on the running, and then they were able to get pregnant pretty quickly. Um, but again, that's few and far between. So really, we do want people exercising, men and women. Can I exercise while trying to conceive or during IVF? Absolutely, safe and beneficial. Um, with IVF, we do need to have some more caution here because if you're actively undergoing stimulation, so you're using your injectables like a gonal or a menopure, then we don't necessarily want you exercising because there's gonna be a lot of swelling of your ovaries and that can increase the risk of ovarian torsion if you're doing any kind of twisting or jumping motions. So most fertility clinics will recommend like just walking only minimal activity during your stimulation. Same goes for an embryo transfer, kind of post transfer in that two week wait. Again, it's very theoretical, but we really want patients taking it easy. So minimal activity, no heavy squats, no, sorry, no heavy lifting, no deep squats, no going for again, like an hour, 10 kilometer run. Like just, you know, light walking, Pilates, yoga, whatever feels good to you. So we still want that blood flow. We just want, don't you want you doing too much? 
But certainly, you know, other than those few instances, exercise is important and beneficial and something that I would recommend. And I'm just gonna stop for a second here just to see. Okay, perfect, no questions. Um, like I say, you can always put them in the chat box for at the end um, and we can go through them then. Okay, BMI. So this is actually a really interesting one. When we look at, for instance, uh, funded cycles for IVF in Ontario, there's no you know, specific cutoff other than age, but there is this line that says it's up to the physician's discretion of the patient's health. And so if the physician feels that you are not in a good place health-wise to do IVF, or your BMI would put you in a morbidly obese category, it is up to them to say that they um, aren't comfortable doing IVF and to take you off of the, the list until you get your BMI down. So BMI certainly is something that's important. And just like exercise, we don't want too little and we don't want too much. So when we look at males, there's a reason the testes are outside of the body. Um, in the scrotum, which hold the testes, they're outside of the body because they need to be at a cooler temperature than inside the body. And heat is one of the worst things for sperm. That's what I talk about, you know, don't cook your balls, don't put your laptop on your lap, which is funny because it's a laptop. Don't put your cell phone in your front pocket where that heat is right, you know, cooking your balls. We wanna keep the heat away. Same goes with excessive sauna or hot tub use. So what we see is that with a high BMI, this can increase scrotal temperature and erectile dysfunction. This actually causes higher levels of estrogen because that body fat does something called aromatize, turning the testosterone into estrogen, which can affect sperm quality and sleep apnea. Um, and because of the higher BMI, there's a higher risk of sleep apnea where there's you know moments in your sleep where you stop breathing. And typically testosterone actually rises in the evening. So if you're not getting good sleep, this can be a big issue. And there was actually a very interesting study where they did what's called a scrotal, I can't say this, scrotal lipectomy. Basically they did liposuction on the scrotum of men who were morbidly obese um, and their sperm quality actually improved. So by getting rid of that excess fatty tissue around the testes, then we saw that there was better sperm quality. In females, specifically a high BMI, um, which is anything over 25, and you can calculate this easy online, we see similar negative effects. Um, so we see that it increases inflammatory markers and high levels of inflammation or these reactive oxygen species can negatively impact fertility and um, IVF outcomes. We see lower clinical and live birth rates. So clinical pregnancy is when you're clinically pregnant. So they've seen that on blood work. What we really care about is live birth rates. Do you take home a baby and higher miscarriage rates? We see higher rates of anovulatory cycles, which means a cycle, menstrual cycle, when you're not ovulating, you're releasing an egg. And this is especially in women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. So when those women, even you know, if they lose five to 10% of their body weight, so for someone that be five to 10 pounds, we can see ovulation resume. So weight loss a little bit can go a long way. We see a negative correlation between higher BNI, BMI and AMH. So if someone's BMI goes up, their AMH, which is their ovarian reserve tends to go down. On the other hand though, and this is definitely with exercise, a low BMI, so a BMI under 18.5 and low body fat percentage, so below like a 20 to 21% can also prevent ovulation. And it's the body's way of saying, this is not the time to bring a baby into the world. I don't have enough resources and fat stores. So we're just going to shut down menstruation and ovulation until a better time. And in those cases, I do find with patients gaining weight, cutting down on exercise, we do get cycles resuming, um, which we need for conception to occur. And I do see here I had a question. Uh, 40 minutes of moderate exercise. Okay, yes. So I do try to recommend um, like... 30 to 45 minutes of moderate exercise on almost all or most days of the week. So absolutely fine to do. More of the concern is if you were doing five or more hours of strenuous exercise. But again, I really want to stress that strenuous piece. So that's like 
like I say, running 10 kilometers, doing an hour CrossFit class or an hour of like intense weightlifting where your heart rate is like 160, 180 beats per minute. Um, so much more intense than what most people are getting to. Um, and one thing, I'm sorry, if I forgot to mention this, if people are like, what is BMI? So BMI stands for body mass index. And it's not perfect, especially if someone has a high muscle mass content, not, um, you know, to be used in pregnancy as well, because obviously you're going to gain weight. Um, but with BMI, we're basically looking at your body weight as a ratio to your height. And we had normals between 18.5 to 25. Um, but we do like to see it around kind of like 21, 22 for fertility. Um, so it is something that if patients are overweight, I do recommend losing weight, not to the extreme point, but just trying to be a bit healthier um, because we know it can be beneficial. Um, perfect. Okay. So next thing, we're going to talk about endocrine disruptors which are becoming more and more important and something that I'm becoming more and more aware of. And we can't live in a bubble. I mean, we can't make our house perfectly green. There are certainly things that we can go through and throw out that just aren't serving us. So phthalates. So phthalates are what make things smell nice, um, like these perfumes. So we love phthalates in our scented body lotions, our scented bath bombs, our perfumes. We love the smell of them, they don't love us and our body doesn't like them either. So what we see when we look at um, sort of metabolites of phthalates in the urine of men, we see that higher levels correlate with higher chances of abnormal sperm. And then especially this has been associated with poor egg and sperm quality. So we see, um, and again, this is an IVF cycle and I, I apologize if not everyone here is actively undergoing IVF. It's just, for those of you who are doing it, you're there basically every day. So it's really easy to study these populations. So a lot of this data comes from IVF because we have access to you um, all hours of the day because you're coming in for cycle monitoring. So when we look specifically at phthalates um, in female patients, again, these metabolites in the urine, we see lower number of uh, total oocytes, mature oocytes, so mature eggs, which we need to fertilize, and top quality embryos. So definitely something that's an issue. Um, so how do you know if phthalates are in a product? Um, it won't necessarily say phthalates, it might just say fragrance or perfume. And so it's one of those ones that's not, it's a bit trickier because it's not specifically listed out like a, a paraben might be, which is another common endocrine disruptor. Um, so really you wanna look for unscented things or specifically you're looking for cleaner beauty products that say on the label phthalate free. Um, one really, really good resource is the Environmental Working Group, EWG. And they have an app on the phone called Think Dirty, um, which is great. Or you can actually just plug in um, on their website, the Think Dirty website. So you could put in your St. Ives body wash, I don't know, sorry to pick on St. Ives, and you'll be able to see kind of a dirty rating for it and what some of the chemicals are. And so I really think this is a simple thing that we can all do at home is looking at our beauty products and trying to remove some of these endocrine disruptors because more and more it's becoming apparent that they're not healthy for us and they're also not healthy for baby. Um, big one here, BPA, which most of us should be familiar with. So BPA got a really bad rap years ago in plastic bottles and specifically in plastic baby products. So we know it interrupts the formation of sperm. High levels in men are linked to erectile dysfunction. And the bigger concern is in women. So if we have our estrogen receptor, when BPA actually binds, it binds really tightly and it doesn't like to come off. And this can disrupt our hormone balance and hormone health because instead of our estrogen binding to our estrogen receptors and modulating them, BPA kind of gets stuck in there. We already know it's linked to breast cancer reproductive problems, and it also seems to be an obesogen, which means it actually kind of promotes obesity, um, probably because of the way that it attaches to estrogen. In rats, we see that prenatal exposure causes decreased fertility, um, and we really want to be avoiding all plastics. Um, and here's the thing, BPA was banned from baby products 
it wasn't banned from all plastics. And so it could still be in a lot of your plastic products. Um, the other thing is though, even if it says BPA free, still want to switch to glass, got my glass cup here, because now what they've done is just replace BPA with something called BPS, which might even be more toxic than BPA. Um, and there's some interesting research coming out of Guelph University on this. So I really try to say, you know, just ditch the plastic, switch to glass or silicon um, or metal and definitely use glass to heat up food. Um, we see that the negative effects of BPA are increased greatly when we heat it because then it kind of leaches into the food. So you always want to use glass containers and really just kind of chuck those old plastic ones and switch everything over. So nutrition, super important, another super confusing area with Dr. Google and what are you supposed to eat? Should I eat gluten? Should I not? What about dairy? This or that? Um, I feel like there's a lot of unfounded and unevidence based uh, advice out there on diet when really there's only research on a couple things, um, most specifically being what we call the Mediterranean diet. So more this Mediterranean style of eating, which I'll get into. So what do we want? We want lots of fruits and vegetables. We want fibrous. We want to get that from our whole grains. We want fish and seafood. We want healthy fats from nuts and olive oil um, for both egg and sperm quality. What do we want to avoid? Processed foods. What is a processed food? Really something that comes in a box or a package or your grandma wouldn't recognize. So hot dogs, pogos, frozen pizzas, prepackaged cereals, granola bars, right? Anything that isn't really a whole food in its natural form. Sugar, definitely added sugars. Coffee, when we're looking at caffeine. Alcohol, definitely a big no-no. Potatoes, again, just consumption of too many refined carbohydrates. Sweets and fat-free dairy negatively affects um, quality. Why fat-free dairy? Well, I think for a couple of reasons. One, if it's fat-free, usually it just means they've added a lot more sugar to it. Um, and so a lot of those fat-free dairies either contain a lot of sugar or a lot of added artificial sweeteners. So instead, better to get a 2% plain full-fat yogurt um, where you don't have a lot of those additives. So then what do we want to incorporate? Beans and lentils are some of my favorite fertility foods and part of the Mediterranean diet. High antioxidant, um, high in fiber, great source of protein. So beans and lentils, really something I'm trying to encourage more of. Berries, when we look at the fruit, not are all created equal. And we want to get fruits that are low in sugar and high in antioxidants, which are those bright, beautiful colors. So reach for all the berries. Frozen berries are totally fine too and great in smoothies. So it doesn't need to be fresh. But we want to um, try and have more berries versus things like bananas or melons, which are high sugar fruits, which don't have as much nutrition. Vegetables, reaching for the rainbow and reaching for a lot of those cruciferous and green vegetables that have a lot of antioxidants and support our liver health. And then nuts, great to have a variety, great source of healthy fats. Um, the ones that are really the healthier nuts, walnuts, really good for sperm, almonds, high in vitamin E, Brazil nuts, great for thyroid health because of their selenium content. So those are the ones we want to reach for more often. So what does this look like? Really, it comes down to a Mediterranean style diet, um, which, you know, doesn't totally fit every person's way of eating. So you can absolutely adapt to your cultural preferences and your food preferences. But what we see is you're being physically active, you're enjoying more whole grain beans, seeds, again, whole foods, fish and seafood, great thing to have as well. Um, you know, having some poultry and meat, but more the star of our plate is fruits and vegetables. And so at lunch and dinner, what I would say, easy rule of thumb, lunch and dinner, half your plate should be vegetables. Um, to really filling that plate with veggies, and then you got a quality protein and a little bit of a whole grain carbohydrate. Doesn't necessarily need to be gluten-free. We don't need to hate on gluten unless it's a specific issue for you. What we're more concerned about is the quality of the food that you're eating. Um, now what I'm gonna do is, oh, I'm just gonna say I have a question here, and then I'm gonna get into the next section 
which is <clears throat> supplements. Oh, no, perfect. That was the same one that I answered. So those were kind of the biggies for diet. Now I'm going to talk about a couple supplements and the reason why um, they're so important to me. So vitamin D, this is a biggie, especially for us here in winter. This vitamin actually acts more like a hormone in our body, very anti-inflammatory. And what we see is higher rates of deficiency in women diagnosed with infertility. And this can actually be as high as like 64% deficiency, also associated with decreased morphology and mortality. The interesting thing is that when we supplement vitamin D, we improve what's called follicular genesis, so growth of the follicles. We increase pregnancy rates and we reduce the risk of miscarriage. Um, now, the key thing here is that it's not just about supplementing with vitamin D. When you actually look at these studies, especially with the risk of miscarriage, we're hitting specific targets. Um, so we can't just say, okay, take vitamin D, because if you're super deficient, you might need to take 10,000 units of vitamin D every day, which is actually a prescription versus taking the general recommendation of 1,000 IUs. So probably one of the lab tests I run most often at my clinic is vitamin D. Some fertility clinics in Toronto do run this. Others do not run it as much. Um, so I am a bit of a stickler for testing because I want to make sure that I'm being sufficient with my dosing. And this year with COVID, I've seen more and more patients who are not just deficient, but like severely deficient. And so normal is over 75, but for fertility, we like it to be closer to 125, 150. And I have patients coming back and their vitamin D is 37, which is just way, way too low. And at that point, we're looking at high dose supplementation and even sometimes injections to get levels up quickly. So really the takeaway is vitamin D is important. It's important for egg and sperm quality, but we have to test because if we don't test your levels, we don't know what we're working with. Um, so if anyone on here is my patient, you know that I'm a bit of a broken record about that, but it's because it's so important. What we see as well is that low vitamin D is actually correlated with low AMH probably because again, it's helping with follicular genesis and growth of those follicles. And so AMH levels can decrease by up to 18% in the winter. But if we supplement with vitamin D and get vitamin D to sufficient levels, we don't see that drop in AMH and we actually keep it up. And so for me, vitamin D is one that I use quite a bit. And as I mentioned, the dose really varies and depends on blood work. Um, so it's something that I'm always looking at most recent vitamin D levels. The next one here is CoQ10 and PQQ. So a lot of people have heard of CoQ10, not so much PQQ. Um, I'm not even trying to spell out what they stand for because they're both really, really long names. So why CoQ10? Why did this get such a hype? So they're concentrated in the mitochondria of the egg and the sperm. And as I mentioned, it comes down to mitochondrial health when we're really talking about egg and sperm quality. And what we started to see is that when we gave CoQ10, we had healthier embryos. Um, dose can really range from 200 to 800 milligrams per day. So this is something that is very patient dependent. Depends on the timeline we have, depends on you know, the age of the patient, depends on their overall health, depends on their diagnosis. Maybe we're giving more, maybe we're giving less. Um, so really needs to be specified to the patient. Um, ubiquinol versus ubiquinone. No. So with CoQ10, there are two forms. Ubiquinol is much more expensive and it's targeted and marketed as the sort of active form of CoQ10. But again, if we think back to like grade 10 science, when we talk about redox and oxidation reactions, CoQ10 naturally flips back and forth between ubiquinol and ubiquinone in the body and it actually gets flipped back and forth the moment you take it with stomach acid. Um, and as well, when we look at the studies, they don't really differentiate between ubiquinol or ubiquinone. They're just kind of giving CoQ10. So I don't stress as much about what form. I stress more about taking it with food and that it's in a like liquid or gel capsule with a fat soluble base. We know it's fat soluble. So it's better if it's in suspended in an oil base as a capsule. I wouldn't really recommend it as a powder. Um, 
but really for dosing and form more specific to the patient. Sometimes I will also add it to PQQ because we see that PQQ and CoQ10 work in a synergistic manner. A lot of the research, I'll be honest right now, on PQQ is on rats, so it's not great. So we're still waiting for some more human studies at this point. But we do see when we give it to um, rats, it increases the number of pups they have in the litter, which we think is then maybe improving egg quality. But we do know that together, they are more effective. And again, they're not necessarily increasing mitochondria. So it's not about more mitochondria. It's about increasing mitochondria efficiency and activity. So again, you can think of these as like gas in the gas tank for the mitochondria and helping with energy production. And we need that energy production in order to produce healthy eggs and sperm. I'm just gonna step out here because I saw there was a question. Is co, oh, so is CoQ10 the same as PQ10? I see it might lose sight that. No, so those are actually different and I'm, I'll explain what Jennifer is talking about. Um, let me just move this here uh, if I can. Okay, perfect. Um, so one company, this is where it gets again, really silly confusing. So there's CoQ10 and PQQ. There's also a form of CoQ10 called PQ10 which is CoQ10, but it's attached in a, it's in a P emulsified phase. So it's a P emulsion, which is the form that they kind of connect it to for better absorption. So they call the CoQ10 PQ10 because it's P emulsified, but it's still CoQ10, it's not PQQ, that's something completely different. So super confusing, and this is why there's so many different forms and doses and everyone is telling you that theirs is better. Certainly there are brands of CoQ10 that I prefer and I have no affiliation or sponsorship with any supplement companies. So I don't get any kickbacks, um, but I am more specific about which brands I use. And there's about three or four that I go between because I know that I can trust their safety and efficacy. Um, here we go again. Okay, so omega-3 fatty acids. Another one of my favorite supplements, but also something that we can get in food as well. So we know that when we just look at diet, a higher dietary intake of EPA and DHA, which are the two important omega-3 fatty acids, improve IVF outcomes and better quality embryos. So when we're studying this again, in couples coming in or patients who are coming in to do IVF because they're an easy population to study and we look at a diet diary, there's a higher percentage of food and higher percentage of calories coming from these omega-3s, we see better outcomes. Also very important for healthy blood flow and uterine lining and implantation. So not just about egg quality, now about how do we get that embryo to actually stick and be sticky and stay in the uterus. So when we give omega-3s, we see better uterine artery blood flow, we see a thicker uterine lining, and we see higher um, sort of markers of implantation in the uterus as well. And so omega-3s are definitely very important. On the flip side, omega-6 fatty acids, so canola, sunflower, safflower, have been shown to negatively impact in fertility. And you might think, well, I don't use these. I don't, I don't cook with them. I cook with olive oil. So where do we get omega-6s? Packaged foods, because they're super cheap. So if you look at your crackers, your hummus, your breads, your pretzels, your baked goods, your frozen pizzas, your frozen entrees, whatever it may be, if you actually look at what oils they're using, even they'll say like, you know, healthier snack foods, it's all going to be cheap omega-6 oils because they're less costly. So that's why we want to avoid those processed foods and try to reach for more whole foods that we can make from scratch. So what are the best sources? Definitely fatty fish, so wild salmon, which is great, much higher in omega-3s than farm salmon. Trout, which doesn't need to be wild, farm salmon, farm trout is okay, sorry. Things like um, sardines as well, um, anchovies, which I didn't put down, I don't like anchovies, but if you do, go ahead and eat anchovies. Um, and mackerel, so any of the kind of fatty fish. Grass-fed beef, so again, we don't need to fear beef. If it's a good organic grass-fed beef that maybe you're having once a week in moderation, 
Um, good intake of omega-3. So definitely something you can include in your diet. Just don't want to have it every day. And then our nuts and seeds. So our walnuts, our chia seeds, our ground flax. These can also be very important. So I always like to start with diet. So looking at diet first, which is why I gave you guys that salmon um, and the walnut crusted salmon with asparagus recipe because that was like perfect omega-3 dinner. Really trying to encourage intake in the diet. But if I'm concerned that diet is low, concerned about egg quality, or especially if we're getting ready for a transfer, and we have reason to suspect um, poor implantation or a thinner uterine lining, then at that point we will need to supplement. This is something that I am a little bit as well stickler about brands and quality. And there's a couple of reasons is one, a lot of the omega-3 supplements on the market are very low. So if you actually look at the amount of EPA and DHA, so the active ingredient per pill, it's often like maybe a couple hundred milligrams and we're trying to go for like gram dosing. So you end up having to take like six or eight pills just to reach a therapeutic dose. So rather than do that, I do switch to brands that I know will reach that dose. The other thing is also contamination. So we do need to be careful with omega-3s when we're supplementing that we're getting them from small cold water fish. So ideally from like Alaska or other sources and they've been third party tested for impurities. So for things like mercury or lead um, and not every single company does this. So it is something to be aware of that you wanna make sure you're not taking a contaminated fish oil which could just have, you know, more problems than, um, you know, the benefits of the omega-3. All right, almost done here. So bear with me. I know you guys probably spent all day looking at slides. Acupuncture, not just for women. So I love acupuncture. I do a lot of fertility acupuncture. As naturopaths, it is part of our practice. Um, so I do often work with acupuncturists. But if patients are seeing me, they are welcome to see me for acupuncture. And other than a brief shutdown in March, um, I've been very busy with fertility acupuncture this year. And it's something that I really enjoy for patients and I see good benefits. So we know acupuncture um, for the person with the uterus who's planning to carry the pregnancy can be very beneficial from a blood flow perspective, from follicle growth, from reducing miscarriages, but there's also benefit for men. Um, and again, small studies, because it might be a bit harder to recruit. So I will admit the sample size is small. But when we look at these two studies um, with males who had poor sperm quality or subfertility, they were receiving acupuncture typically twice a week for five weeks. We see a significant improvement in sperm viability, sperm motility, which is important for how they swim. Um, which can then lead to better, you know, pregnancy rates and IVF outcomes. And so if I'm working with a couple or someone's working with a known sperm donor and there is some sperm issues, I will recommend acupuncture one to two times a week for a month prior to IVF. So in that case, maybe both partners are coming in for it um, because we know that it can be really beneficial. So definitely something that can be helpful, still able to do right now. Um, and something that I continue during early pregnancy as well. And last but not least, I do want to speak a little bit about IV therapy. So IV therapy or intravenous vitamin therapy is something that's quite unique to higher health. Um, it requires a lot of additional training and certification as naturopaths. So there's not too, too many of us who have undergone all of that training. With my fertility IVs, we're essentially taking nutrients that we know are important for fertility and putting them directly into the veins so that we can get higher absorption for bypassing digestion. It's not something that I recommend to every patient, certainly something that's more important if we're working on a shorter timeline to let's say an IVF cycle, or if there's a history of a lot of inflammation, reactive oxygen species, a poor prognosis, you know, poor IVF outcomes, and in those cases, we're really trying to increase antioxidant levels very quickly. Um, so here are some of the key ingredients we do in our fertility IV formulas. So looking at those B vitamins, so our B complex, um, our magnesiums, 
are methylated folate and methylcobalamin. So again, the active form of our very important folate and B12, which is something that I do discuss with patients when we're looking at how to choose the right prenatal. L-carnitine, which is important for mitochondria and actually acts as a bit of a shuttle to get CoQ10 in. NAC, which I'll sometimes use orally as well um, in certain cases for quality and uterine lining. Selenium for our thyroid, vitamin C for reducing those reactive oxidation species, and then zinc. So this is a big part of more of the, the sperm um, uh, male formulas that we use as well. So certainly something that we can discuss with patients. And if I feel it is something that needs to be included in a treatment plan, we can do it. Safe to do once per week. Um, and most patients feel really quite good after it. And so it's something that I will prescribe if necessary. So those are kind of the main things for tonight. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, I'm just about right on time. I was trying to keep it to under an hour and we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so thank you again so much for all of you joining me. I realize you're all busy and you're all spending all day on Zoom. We will also have the recording of this available. So for people who couldn't make it, we'll be able to share it. Um, as I said, I practice at Higher Health Naturopathic Center in Ivy Lounge in Toronto. Although I do see patients all across Ontario, I have some patients who live all the way up in Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, um, as far east as Ottawa, um, who are coming to me for my guidance um, in their fertility journey. So we can do virtual and in-person consults. And if you want to get to know a little bit about me, um, you can check out my website, which is just my name. You can follow me on Instagram where I'm always posting lots of content. And I hope that I can see you guys in person as a patient or at future fertility events. And I'd love to work with you. So what I'll do now is I'll just uh, leave this here and leave the Q&A. So you're welcome to leave or if you have a question um, that you would like to answer more privately, you can always send me an email and you should have gotten my clinic email, some of you for the invite, or you can go to my website and all my contact information is there. Um, but if anyone else has any other questions about something that came up in the presentation or something that I didn't mention that you have questions about, I'll certainly hang out for the next 10 minutes and I'd be happy to answer those for you. So I'll just see here. Um, so yeah, so Jen, hopefully that answered your question because I know what product you're talking about. Um, but yes, the specifically the PQ10 in the Usite app is CoQ10 and not PQQ. <laughs> I, every time I speak to the rep for that company, I'm like, you guys could have picked another name <laughs> because it's just very, very confusing indeed. <laughs> so yeah, I'll give it a couple more minutes um, and see if anyone types in any other questions. But as I said, you can always send me an email afterwards if it's something that you're not comfortable sharing right now. <laughs> oh, let me see here in the chat. Um, for that brand, uh, okay, so good question. Um, so the brand that Jennifer is referring to, um, there's a company called NFH, which again, I have no affiliation with. Um, they are a good company brand, they're Canadian, and I, I do try to stick to Canadian companies because their um, sort of stringency around natural health products is quite a bit stronger than American brands. Um, for each specific product, um, you know, I tend to do a lot of mixing. I don't tend to use a lot of all in one products because I like to tailor things more specifically to my patients. When we look at safety in pregnancy, um, certainly a more difficult one to answer because frankly, we don't have a lot of safety data. Um, I'm pretty cautious in the first trimester. Um, so I do tend to slowly wean people off of things. There are things that I absolutely feel comfortable um, continuing things that I will stop and things that I will reduce the dose and wean off. And I feel very comfortable with my protocols now and what I do and don't include. So when it comes to pregnancy safety, very individualized, very good to always speak with a naturopath because you don't want to be taking something that is not safe in pregnancy, um, but certainly something that you want under the guidance of, you know, whoever prescribed that for you. Um, and they need to be pretty confident in their dosing in pregnancy. 
Um, I see another question. Oh, just thank you for the great presentation. You're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> but yeah, I can't speak too, too much to the specific brands because as I say, I don't work for any specific companies. Um, more what I'm looking for often is dose because as I said, a lot of the times, you know, patients come in on 10 different fertility products that they've bought online or read about. And it's kind of like a sprinkling, right? Like I see them taking 10 things at a sub dosing level where it's not going to have an effect. And what I find what really works better is taking four to five things at a therapeutic level where we know that it's been studied and it's evidence-based and we're going to see an effect for that. Um, so those are the things I'm looking for. Certainly brand, um, certainly absorption. Are you taking things correctly? Like things like CoQ10 should more be taken, frankly, in divided doses than all at once, because there's a question of how much we absorb. So these are the things that a naturopath can really help guide with is not just what to take, but when to take it and how to take it with or without food, away from other medications. Um, you do want to be careful when you're undergoing IVF because if, if you're undergoing IVF um, or even just a medicated cycle, like you're or doing an IUI, you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on treatment and medication. And the last thing you want to do is be taking some over-the-counter herbal product that's going to negatively interfere. Um, so I would say definitely work with a professional to ensure that you're taking the right things. <laughs> Um, I'll just see here, the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so and something that I didn't get into too, too much. Um, and this is kind of a one that's a whole other topic for like another day for sure. Um, when we look at prenatals, there is different forms of folate. So there's folic acid, um, which is the synthetic form of folate and then there's 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate which is the activated form of folate and in certain patients who are what we call homozygous for MTHFR means that they have a defective methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme and they cannot convert that synthetic folic acid into the active folate that we need. If we're not able to do that we can't get the benefits of folate. And in some patients, this can increase the risk of miscarriage. So the only way we know for sure is running a full genetic panel, or we could simply give folate, um, the methylated folate, which is in some brands. Um, the one, Jennifer, that you're referring to is folate, is methylated folate and does have iron in it as well. Um, in some patients, though, the iron levels are not enough, if, especially if patients are anemic or borderline anemic going into their pregnancy. So pre-pregnancy, once they're pregnant, it's very likely that their that anemia will develop and their iron will tank. And in those cases, we will need to supplement with more iron. Similar to many other things, I'm really looking at the dose and the form of iron as many can be super constipating and not well tolerated. Um, so I am more particular about what form of iron I'm using, the actual type that they like use to formulate it. Um, and I am looking at with patients who I think are at risk for MTHFR, or I suspect some methylation issues. Um, I will recommend switching to a prenatal that has methylated folate. One really common prenatal not to pick on it is Smarty Pants, um, which people like because it's a gummy. But, and it does have methylated folate, but it actually doesn't have any iron in it. Um, so in those cases, if you're someone who's low in iron, probably not good for you to take it. Um, and you might need to supplement on top. But, um, you know, reaching for a more good quality prenatal that doesn't have synthetic fillers or dyes, doesn't have added colors, has B vitamins in their methylated form is important. And that's something when we do our IV therapy, um, we do use an active B complex and the folate and the B12 that we add is methylated as well. So you're not getting the synthetic version of them, but you're getting the active form, which increases levels um, more quickly. So I could do a whole other presentation on prenatals. Um, and I've made some uh, really intense prenatal comparison charts. 
to show patients just how different each prenatal is. So yes, you might be spending more on a certain prenatal, but the amount that you're getting in that prenatal is, is way more. Um, not including folate. Okay, so for why people might not want to take a prenatal that doesn't have folate, um, I'd have to know more about your case as to know why they're recommending you don't take folate because folate is kind of the key thing in a prenatal. The problem too is if you don't take a prenatal, like a lot of women will just take a woman's multivitamin. Um, those tend to be high in vitamin A, which can be dangerous for the baby. Beta carotene is not a concern. It's actually the retinols or the retinoids in vitamin A that we need to be careful with how much um, we consume. So I do try to reach for a prenatal over top of a woman's multi from that vitamin A perspective. In terms of prenatal without folic acid or folate, I'd have to understand why you're not taking folate in the first place. So that would probably be more of a, a conversation we could have like between you and me as a patient. So we could figure out what would be best for you. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna see the chat here. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, sorry, uh, my name is <laughs> confusing. My name is Laura. Um, I should have changed my name on here. It's Tara Campbell's our clinic owner. It's her account because I don't have a paid Zoom account. <laughs> So my bad that I didn't um, rename myself. I can do that now because it's never too late. Um, but yeah, Tara Campbell owns Higher Health and she let me use her Zoom account, but my name is actually Laura. So I'm sorry, I didn't get that clear. <laughs> nope, that's my bad, don't worry. Um, and I'll just see the last question here while we have a chance. Um, oh, it was the same one just on polite. So yeah, I, I don't know why we wanna prenatal that doesn't have folate, I'd, I'd have to know more about your specific case, but certainly looking at prenatals and picking a good quality prenatal. There are a few brands that I recommend. Again, not just one company I work with. Um, there's three or four that I kind of rotate in between depending on what I'm looking for, for in a patient. And these are where every plan is individualized. So I'm going to wrap it up because I know it's eight o'clock and you guys have been very patient. So as I said, you can follow me on Instagram, reach out to my website. I'm at Higher Health Center on Tuesdays and Fridays, offering both virtual and in-person consultations. So if you're ready to take that next step um, and book that full initial consultation, where we'll go through a lot of these um, different things in way more detail and really explore your health history, I'd be happy to work with you. And uh, don't be a stranger. If you have questions after this, you can email me and we will also send out the recording. So have a good night, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us.